Good to be with you this morning, and uh, hello, if I've not met you before, um, it's glad you can be with us at King's this morning, and hi to those online as well. Um, as many know, Gene and I have been um, down in Lowestoft quite a bit recently, helping church down there. We're going to be down there for the rest of this month, pretty much, um, but then after that, that sort of season starts to come to an end in terms of the quantity of time, so we'll be back around more, which looking forward to, really looking forward to. Yeah, well, one person's happy. That's good. <laughs> And I paid Tom. So, <laughs> But if you've got a Bible, turn to Galatians, uh, New Testament, if you're new to the Bible. And we're doing this series called, um, as it says on the screen, really, Free to Follow. Um, so look, when you think about the word freedom, I wonder what sort of, what comes to mind? If someone stopped you in the street and asked you, Tell me what you think freedom is and what it looks like and how it's worked out in your life. I wonder how you would uh, answer that question. What does it mean to actually even be free? There are those who would say that freedom is just an, and it's an illusion, that we think we've got this thing called free will, but it's just an illusion. We're actually all determined by our histories and our genetics and the things that go on external to us. Those things are the major influences on our lives, and you're just not free. Whole books have been written on it, whole philosophy, determinism. You're just not free. And some would go as far to say, therefore, you cannot be held morally accountable for your actions either because everything is determined. You have no free will. You have no sort of causation over your own actions, your own thoughts. They're all determined. Now, I'm not going to spend ages on that, but I wonder what you think freedom is. If you go to a dictionary, it will say things like this, that freedom is the state of not being enslaved. It's the state of not being imprisoned. Or freedom is the power or the right to act and say and think whatever you want. Often in our culture, isn't it, that you hear the phrase, be whatever you want to be. Do whatever you want to do. do. Fulfill everything that you're meant to be. Be your kind of truest self, in, and you're free to be that and to do that and so on. It, it does have a caveat on it, as long as when you're doing all of that, you're not hurting anyone else. So even there we start to see something about freedom. True freedom isn't freedom from everything. In fact, true, true freedom really can only ever really be known in the context of constraints. Even in our culture that, see, that, that could be so kind of liberal in the sense of do anything, go anywhere, be what you want, but there's this constraint, as long as you don't hurt anyone. We can't avoid that when it comes to freedom. You may have heard this illustration before, but... I think it might be helpful that, imagine little Freddy Fishy, and he's swimming through the sea. He loves the sea. He's in the Atlantic, big ocean. Is the fish, is Fishy Fred, Fred the fish, <laughs> getting tongue-tied, is he free? It's not a trick question. Well, is he free? Well, yeah. So, yes, because he's a fish. Imagine little fish, Freddy, decides one day, I want to be free, free from the constraints of the ocean. And so he leaps onto dry land. Is little Fred the fish, I shouldn't have done Fs. <laughs> should have called him Bill or something. Is he free? No. What is little Fred the fish now? Dead. So the point is, is that we can never really only know freedom in the context of constraints, of limitations. The fish is free while it lives in water. As a human being, am I really free? What does it mean to be free? Well, we've got to answer the question first, what does it mean to be a human being? And, and, what, and how do we answer that question? Where do we go for answers to that question? Freedom is not living without restrictions. Freedom is not living without constraints, with limits, and it's not living without even, I would say, laws.
but it's finding the right ones that kind of fit our humanity, the ones that cause us to flourish most, that they fit us, they liberate us, and they lead to the most human flourishing that there can be. That's what we're really looking for. And so we're going to read in Galatians how Paul wants to fight, as it were, for the freedom of the gospel that we've been singing about this morning. So let's read, we're just going to read like four verses. We're kind of doing verses 1 to 10, as it were, but I'm just going to read the first four verses of Galatians chapter 2. And it says this. So Paul says, after an interval of 14 years, speaking about the last time, it's just in the previous verses, that he went up to Jerusalem. I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus also along. It was because of a revelation I went up and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, that's the non-Jews. But I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But it was because of the false brothers secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty or our freedom, which we have in Christ, in order to bring us into bondage. I'm going to focus in really kind of on verse 4 there, that last verse I read. Paul's writing to the church, or the churches in Galatia, and they're getting kind of off track when it comes to this good news about Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross and everything that goes with that. They're getting off track, and they're in danger of taking hold of what Paul calls a different gospel. It's just not the deal that I'm, I'm preaching. And last week, Chris unpla- unpacked this really helpfully for us, and he used a couple of images. And the first thing he did, so I'm going to use them again just to kind of remind us and reinforce this to us, is that these people were saying, look, it's Jesus plus. Jesus plus. That these fake Christians, if you like, sneaked in. Um, the word that is written, uh, that's written there means to sidle alongside. They didn't kind of come in all guns blazing. They didn't come in and kind of stand up in front of everyone and get them together and make a big announcement, it seems. They kind of sidled in, sneaked in, came among us, and they started to come alongside and say, yeah, but this whole Jesus deal, this crucifixion deal, yeah, yeah, Jesus and the cross, I, I get that, but actually I think that we still need to be circumcised. There's still this Old Testament law thing. We can't ignore that. And people started to maybe get drawn, as well, they did. They started to get drawn away from the grace of God. And, and, and Paul is writing to them because he so cares for them and he wants to put them back on track. But it's saying that Jesus is basically not quite enough. This old sign, circumcision, of the old covenant, this promise of God that, that, that you were part of the people of God. Paul's saying, no, no, that, that's, that's old. It was pointing towards something. And even the Old Testament, Paul will draw out later, I think, in Galatians, where he talks about it's circumcision of the heart. It's not even of the flesh. It's, it's always pointing towards these. The Old Testament are shadows that point towards this greater news, this greater one, Jesus. So that's what they're doing. It's Jesus plus blank. Now, I'm guessing that most people in this room that your struggle when it comes to Jesus plus is not, I'm really thinking about getting circumcised. Is that fair to say? Now, it may be, genuinely, you know, I don't want to, it may be that someone is struggling with that. If you've come from a Jewish background or whatever, you may be thinking, but what, what happens to the Old Testament law? Well, a lot of that gets answered later on in this letter. But I'm just guessing in this context, it's not going to be most of our issue. But I still wonder whether we struggle with the Jesus plus deal. Or do we really live in the grace of God? It might be Jesus plus, well, I don't know, do I have I prayed enough this week? Jesus plus, have I read the Bible enough? Jesus plus, have I been religious enough, gone to church enough, said prayers enough, sung enough, repented enough? Whatever it might be is enough. Jesus plus. Or maybe if I feel bad enough for long enough, maybe somehow then that God will forgive me and and I can know this amazing grace that everyone else seems to sing about and so on. Or sometimes we maybe think, well, it's Jesus plus 
I'll do something to make up for my bad works, the things I've done wrong. I know I've done something wrong, so I need to do something good now. Maybe it's that. I wonder how, I think that's quite common in our culture. That if I'm going to be made right with God, if God's going to love me and all the rest of it, well, I've done something bad, so I'll do something good. There was a uh, father whose son was, was going off the rails, and just every day he was doing things to harm and, and, and hurt people. And, and, and so the father was thinking, what do I do? You know, what do I do about this? And every day the father would get a block of wood out, and he'd get a nail. And every time the son did something wrong, he'd smack the nail into the piece of wood. And the son's sort of watching this, okay, yeah. he goes away, does something wrong, bang, another nail goes in. Bang, another nail, 10, 20, 30 days, nails going into this wood. Eventually, this whole, this piece of wood is filled with nails. And the son is thinking, I'm not entirely sure what's going on here, but something's happening, and, uh, and maybe I need to do something about this. And he starts to do good. And every time the son does something good, the father gets his hammer and he takes one of the nails out of the piece of wood. And the son does something else good. He takes another nail out of the piece of wood. The son does something else good. He takes another nail out of the piece of wood. Eventually, there's no nails left in the piece of wood. And the son might think, well, that's great, until the father holds up the piece of wood to his son. And his son still sees the holes that have been made by these nails in this piece of wood. One good thing does not outweigh and stop the damage of one bad thing. It's bad maths, as we say. And yet it is so common in our thinking that if we think, well, if I just do a good thing, it doesn't. It doesn't undo the wrong thing. It doesn't undo the holes. It's so important this. It's not Jesus plus. It doesn't deal with the problem that we've got. We've done these things. The holes are there. How can they be sorted? It doesn't lead to freedom either. It just leads to slavery. Well, how many good things do you have to do to undo a good thing? For how long and how much? I mean, it's going to lead to just this kind of deal of feeling enslaved. And that's why Paul says it's not the way. In fact, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, when Paul says it's for freedom Christ has set you free, therefore don't, ever, don't, don't go lo- any longer back to what he calls a yoke of slavery. Don't go back to that yoke of slavery. A yoke was either with, you've got a a couple of oxen or something, cows, you know, you might have a yoke, this wooden thing that sat over them um, and kept them together, this yoke that sat on them. When it comes to slavery, maybe you had a yoke of iron bar or something like that, or a neck thing that goes around. A yoke is something that sits on you, that keeps you bound to something. For the Jews, it was the, they called the the law that kind of you're coming under obedience of the law. It's like a yoke that you're bound to, you have to keep. And Paul says, hey, don't go back to this yoke of slavery. And he's making the point throughout Galatians. In fact, I think he said like four times up into chapter two and three that no one is justified, made right with God by works of the law. He makes that point time and time again throughout the entire letter. He wants us to get hold of it. It's not Jesus plus. That is not, excuse me, that is not Good news. So our freedom, he says, is in Christ. It's Jesus, the cross. And this is the symbol that, bring the next one up, where Chris said, look, don't, you know, don't let the bar slip down, as it were. Raise it up. And we get the shape of the cross. It's there that Paul says we find freedom. Last week at the beginning of the meeting, I sort of touched on the end of Galatians, where, just, where Paul says that if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in the cross. And just highlighted how bizarre that is to boast in this, this form of execution, of public shaming that the, cru- cru- the cross represented. That how bizarre it was to, to boast, to celebrate, to, to glory in, like Paul is saying there, the cross. Why would anybody do that? I try and thinking about kind of, well, how would it have felt back then for people to say, look, it's, 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 it's Jesus crucified. This is God in Christ on the cross. How that would have felt to people. Because I think sometimes we can, um, I don't know, it, it just it can easily bypass us. 
think, oh yeah, that was normal. No, it was not normal. <laughs> it was utterly unexpected. The image that came to my mind was it's like sandpaper on nails, on your nail, just that sort of, what? I don't know what you're like with that, but that sends shivers down my spine just thinking about it. How can this be? Unless it's the way that God works to bring the best news to our broken world and our broken lives. That we're made right with God, we're justified. Ephesians says, by grace, through faith, in who? In Christ. When Paul is up in front of the Jews in Acts chapter 13, he's going around telling people about Jesus. In Acts 13, 38 to 39, it says, he says, through him, through Jesus, there's forgiveness of sin. Why? Because God doesn't put under the carpet the holes that we make through the things that we do in our lives, our sin. He doesn't just shove it under the carpet and say, hey, it doesn't really matter. We'll ignore that. No. Jesus takes the nails in himself. The punishment that he takes brings us peace because he stands in our place. And so Paul says through him there's forgiveness, which requires someone to take the cost because true forgiveness is really costly. And then he goes on in, in Acts chapter 13, 38 to 39, and says that we're freed from all the things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Speaking about it, it's Old Testament law. Just think, if you want to put it in a sort of Ten Commandments, well, Jesus says, if you love the Lord your God, this is kind of the law in everything. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, I failed. <laughs> I haven't done that. All my life, I don't do that every day in, in the way that I know I'm meant to. And so we can't depend on our works to rescue us. So I love the invitation that Jesus gives. This is in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. And you're very familiar to some of you, or many of you, but may not be familiar to you at all. But this is the invitation that Jesus gives. And just remember when I read this that Paul says, don't return to a yoke of slavery, a yoke, this thing that binds you. But remember also that true freedom means finding the restraints, if you like, the yoke that is going to fit best, that brings you the most freedom. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, hear that? Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. That's Jesus teaching his ways, what he's done, who he is. Take it upon your life and you will find rest. Learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Why? For my yoke, there it is again, is easy and my burden is light. Jesus' ways, his works, his ways of living, the things he says, his teaching. I was listening to someone the other day who, was, who had kind of walked away from God and, and Jesus, but was still kind of saying, but I, I, I kind of love his teaching. But I love this bit and that bit and that bit and that bit. I'm like, well, I think it's kind of all or nothing. It's not like the pack of revels you get. You might pick the coffee ones out because you don't like them. <laughs> Have you taken on Jesus' yoke? Rest for your souls. Why? Because you haven't got to strive and drive and make yourself right with God because it is all of grace. We've been singing it all morning, haven't we? It's all of grace. And Paul says, you know, in Romans chapter 6, he goes, well, hey, surely someone's going to say, well, surely I can go on kind of sinning then, knocking nails into the piece of wood because it's going to make God look better because he's going to keep forgiving me. And Paul says, by no means, you've just totally misunderstood grace because grace does what? Grace is an empowering deal. It enables us to say no, to live self-controlled and upright lives. That's what it says in, in Titus. That's what grace does. It changes you from the inside out as you receive that free gift of amazing grace. And for Paul, this was really personal. In, in, in Galatians 2 verse 20, he says that, that, he, that he loved me. He gave himself for me. Can you say that? Have you ever said that? He loves me. He's given himself for me. The grace of God is for me. I don't get bypassed or overlooked. 
is to anyone who would humble themselves and just say, Lord, I need you. Have mercy on me, Lord, a sinner. That's it. Beautiful grace. Take hold of it if you haven't. And also then I'd say, just to say, you know, the follow-up to that, if you have, and you've not baptized yet, get baptized. This beautiful public demonstration, expression of your faith in Christ, in the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. We've got Easter Sunday coming up soon. It's going to be great to get baptized on Easter Sunday. So if you've not been baptized, can I encourage you to, and you've given your life to Christ, go and talk to someone. Talk to myself or one of the leaders here or the welcome team or to your life group leader or your youth leader, whoever it might be. Talk to someone about it, but I encourage you, get baptized. Don't wait to think, <laughs> oh no, I've got to wait till I'm good enough to get baptized. That, that's that Jesus plus deal again. <laughs> Don't fall for that trap. That's not how grace works. So our freedom is in Christ. Second thing is this, our freedom is worth worth fighting for. Um, I was out for a meal. Well, Gene and I were out for a meal, actually, with our good friends Kevin and Susie the other week, and uh, we got in a bit of a conversation during that meal. I haven't told you I was going to share this, so well, it's tough. Uh, <laughs> and we got in a conversation over a certain drink called an espresso martini. <laughs> Here's a picture of it here. And um, so the, the, the conversation was like this. Is an espresso martini, which contains, is it two parts vodka, an espresso, um, some coffee liqueur, and something else, yeah? Is it a pudding, or is it a drink? Well, hang on, hang on, hang on just, just before you go there. So we were debating this back and forth, and I was, I was fighting my corner. <laughs> they were fighting theirs. Um, and then, then Kev played a dirty one. He asked the waiter. Because Kev was convinced that it's a pudding. And I was like, no, it's not. It's, it's a drink. Ask the waiter. What did the waiter say? Pudding. Pudding. Now, look. Some things are worth fighting for. Of course this isn't. But if we were to take a vote, if you think this is a pudding or a drink, who thinks Pudding. <laughs> I'm not even going to follow up with the next question. But some things are not worth, that's not worth proving your point on. Okay, it's really not. It's not worth fighting for. But some things are worth fighting for. And that's Paul's point here, is grace, the freedom we have in God, is worth fighting for. In fact, he says in, uh, he says in verse 5 here, if we went on to read, but we did not yield in submission to them, subjection to them, for even an hour. Not for a second did we yield to those that would say Jesus plus. He was, it was something that was absolutely worth fighting for. And in fact, in verse 11, he goes on to challenge Peter, disciple of Jesus, to his face because he thinks Peter is starting to do a bit of Jesus plus. For Paul, this was worth being persecuted for. He goes on to say that later on in Galatians. That why am I being persecuted if I'm saying Jesus plus circumcision? The point is, the reason I'm being persecuted is because I'm not. But he's fighting for this. He's taking hold of it. And it's really important that we do this as well. Now, the way we speak about it is important. The way we are gracious with our words. But we do not compromise on this. And why is it so important? Because if you read Galatians 2.21, he says, if we compromise on this and say Jesus plus, it nullifies the grace of God and Jesus died for nothing. That's how important this is. That we never allow Jesus plus. We nullify the grace of God. To nullify something, you declare it invalid. It's a rejection of it. It's letting the bar slip. Don't let the bar slip from the cross to a plus. Don't let it slip. So our freedom's in Christ. Our freedom is worth fighting for. It's really important, this, though, in terms of what we, you know, the, the martini, you know, espresso martini thing's tongue-in-cheek, kind of. The, um, <laughs> but there are things that we can fight for sometimes which are debatable issues, 
when it comes to theology, when it comes to what the Bible says about some things. And we can kind of think they're the things that are worth kind of dying and dividing over. And it's really important that we know the distinction between some things are debatable issues. There are some things that you're gonna di- we, we are going to differ on within the church. We're going to have different views on some things. They're not the things that are worth dying and dividing over. And how we hold those things really, really matters. And uh, we do it with much grace. And I'd encourage you, if you're grappling with that, if you think there's things with our conscience and conviction around certain things, I'd encourage you to go and read Romans 14 and Romans 15. And read how the advice that Paul gave the church in Rome about how they handle these differences. For them, it was food and days that were special. Some were saying that and others were saying, no, they're not. Paul says, hey, apply the gospel right into the middle of this in your lives. It's so important how we handle these differences, but also knowing the things that we do believe, saved by grace, through faith, not by works. It's all of grace. Then out from this amazing grace, the third thing, our freedom is the place that we serve others from. You know, we sang it earlier, didn't we? Freely I've received, so freely now I give. Freely I've received, freely I give. This is the, the grace of God is the motivating factor, power in our lives to live the way God wants us to live, to grow in loving and serving others. As Jesus on the cross, the way he gave himself for us, in the same way we start to give out our lives in all sorts of ways. And Paul here in, in verse 10, right towards the end of this chapter, he's saying that the, the guys in Jerusalem, they kind of got to the end of talking about things, And then they said, the only thing they asked us to remember, they didn't change the gospel, it was the same gospel that was being preached in Jerusalem as Paul was preaching. It says, the only thing they asked us to remember was the poor. And Paul says, well, that was the very thing that I'd made it my business to do anyway. It was the very thing that was on my heart to do. Paul knew the Bible, he knew the Old Testament, and it is shot through. You cannot miss God's heart for those who feel on the edge, the the, the broken, the, the disempowered, those who are being trampled over by oppressive powers and injustice. It speaks throughout the Old Testament. Paul knew it. It was in his heart. I mean, Proverbs 14, 31 really puts it quite starkly. It says, basically, if you oppress the poor, you insult your maker. Now, that needs unpacking, I realize, but sometimes it's good to take things just on the kind of starkness of things. Oppress the poor, Insult God. I mean, that's a huge deal. This is how much it matters to God. And for Paul, he lived his life in that way. Later on, he'll say in the letter, do good to all people. And remember that we remember the poor not to earn God's approval, not to gain God's acceptance, or to receive his forgiveness. That's not why we serve others. That's not why we give. Martin Luther of the 1500s, Reformation, said, God doesn't need your good works, but your neighbor does. I like that. God doesn't need your good works. Your neighbor does. People around you do. People in this world, they do. And the poor that he's most likely referring to here are the the famine that was going on in Jerusalem. So mainly sort of Jewish church that Paul made this collection. You can read about that through the book of Acts and through 2 Corinthians as well. And there's kind of two effects that this would have had. This, Paul was, was remembering the poor. He was collecting money from around these mainly non-Jewish churches to give to the church in Jerusalem to help those who were struggling um, because of the famine. The first need, the effect it would have had, and this is pretty obvious, I realize, is the needs of the poor would have been met. Well, that's a good thing, isn't it? People in need. And at King's, this has been a massive part of our DNA over, well, since ever, really, A huge part of what we've done over the years is is serving those who want to empower people, help them to walk free from poverty, all sorts of different types of poverty. And over the past couple of weeks, I've had various conversations with people, just hearing the way that people are outworking this in their everyday lives and out there in the world. Things we've done more organized as a church, like King's Care, we did for many years, um, showers, laundry, um, some clothes, food, all that sort of stuff for many years, and that came to an end. And community money advice, helping people out of debt, We've been involved with all sorts of things and currently doing various projects as well. But we're really at a season of just seeking God for the next thing, really. And what is it God
God's calling us to. And a team of us have been gathering to pray, to talk, to think, and we've been processing that over about nine months. And the heart of what we really feel going forward, over this next year particularly, and I'll read it out, is, is one thing really. Not to start a big project on something, but we want to find ways to deepen the DNA of God's heart for the poor across all the church family and help equip us all to live it out in our everyday lives. That's what we want to do. Just keep pressing in, deepen it. We know it's there. We know that people are doing this, but it's one of those things just to lean into this and see people equipped and so on for, them, for how we might live this out every day, where we find ourselves. And yes, some more organized projects might spring from that. Who knows what might come from that? And how are we going to do that? We haven't worked it out yet. Um, but we're, we're also now partnering with Jubilee Plus, which is a, uh, a charity organization that helps serve churches and help them in this. And some of you will be aware of that. Have a look at that. We'll send, I'm assuming we've sent links out for these things before. But this is what we want to lean into in this next season. So look out for things through on Sundays, through life groups, and, and other ways as well that we're going to work this out in the church. But the other thing, just to say as we land, is that the other effect this would have had was the unity of the church across cultural differences would have been strengthened. That's a really important one here. The unity of the church across cultural differences would have been strengthened. Well, how would have that worked? Well, these non-Jews, these, these we call Gentiles, and, and these churches that Paul was working with, these people that Paul was saying, hey, we want to give, and I want you to give to those that are, are Jewish. That would have been a huge deal. And in so many ways, they're just following what Jesus taught. And like the Good Samaritan, Jesus told these stories that just shocked people, these, these twists, how these priests had walked past this person broken on the floor and messed up, had been mugged and was beaten up and couldn't do anything. And a, and, and, and a priest walks by and a, and a Bible expert kind of walks by. You know, I haven't got time. I'm a Bible expert. I haven't got time for that. Well, I'm a priest. I haven't got time for that. And then Jesus brings in the kind of sucker punch when he says a Samaritan came past. Oh, that's the enemy of the Jews. We don't like Samaritans. And the Samaritan stopped. And the Samaritan loved his neighbor as himself. And, and, and these, these, these Gentiles who are willing to give to their Jewish brothers and sisters was a huge deal. And so when we give, it's, it's great to be able to give into all sorts of different things. And more recently with the gift day, um, that wasn't announced this morning, was it? Um, yeah, gift day so far. We had two weeks ago, was it? I think it's around 29 plus thousand pounds, which is wonderful. It's worth a well done. Thank you for generosity. It really is. And we said uh, uh, some of that money we're going to give away like 10%, 10% um, some of that to church planting, but also some to our friends in Kenya. Culturally different to us, but we want to help them out with their flood response because of, uh, so many lives have been damaged through that. And so it's a wonderful expression of this kind of unity of the church in the way that we give as well. Just bring us back to our freedom in Christ, where we live out from, we fight for, we serve out from, we give out from this grace of God. Let's keep taking hold of it, keep celebrating it, keep living in the good of it, and helping one another live in the good of it as well. Shall we stand, please? And I'd like to invite the band back up, Tim. And uh, don't let the bar slip. If, if you've been living in Jesus Plus in any of the kind of ways that I've said or other things that have come to your mind, lean into his grace. And if you want to delve into some sort of depth on it a little bit more, Terry Virgo's book, it's an old book, but God's Lavish Grace, there's a couple of copies on the bookstore there. I can't read it without the glass. Eight quid. Is that five quid? No, I'm kidding. Eight quid. I won't start. <laughs> um, eight quid. So that's on the bookstore at the back. But, but let's just pray. And then the band will lead us. There's a story that's told of C.S. Lewis when he walks into a room full of theologians and they're all trying to work out what's the difference of Christianity and every other kind of world religion. And Lewis just looked at them. I don't know whether he said that's easy, but he just said, oh, that's grace grace. And so, Father, I thank you for grace. I thank you, Lord. We haven't got a, 
strive and drive and work our way into your good books. The law was never intended for that. And uh, and thank you for Paul fighting for this. Lord, thank you for Jesus, who is the grace of God to us. And I I pray just help us to receive that, to live in the good of it, to drink deeply of your grace, Lord, and to celebrate it, Father. And may it be the motivating factor, the motivating power in our lives to live the way that you then call us to live. Lord, thank you, your ways, they do fit us. They do liberate us. And I pray, may we never turn away back again to Jesus plus, but just lean into that grace and live out from that grace in your precious name. Amen.